Hey there, beautiful Tangled Mess here with another podcast episode of Live Free, Dine Hard, the Creepy Pasta Edition. So, what is creepy pasta anyway? No, it's not noodles shaped in weird or creepy ways. It's a community of talented writers. And according to Creepypasta Wiki, Creepypasta are essentially internet horror stories passed around on forums and other sites to disturb and frighten readers. The name Creepypasta comes from the word copypasta, an internet slang term for a block of text that gets copied and pasted over and over again from website to website. The story that I'm about to share with you was written by a woman named Jay Swogar, who was inspired to write this story based on a dream that she had long ago combined with the influential writings of H.B. Lovecraft, who was known for his love of horror and weird fiction. The story that I'm going to read to you today is called The Facility. It only took her a moment to figure out that this wasn't where she wanted to be. The paint chipped and wallpaper peeled down as if bowing its head in resignation to the dilapidated state of the facility. She walked gingerly up the hall, dodging the debris that lay scattered across the yellow laminate floor. An old, rusted wheelchair sat propped against the side door that led to nothing but darkness as far as she could tell as she passed it. A pair of crutches leaned against the jamb of another door to her right, this one wide open to a room much more visible in the diminishing daylight. She made her way cautiously toward the door, nearly tripping over a loose section of flooring. When she got to the doorway, she peered in and felt her stomach churn with revulsion. There was a solitary window letting in the sickly, pale, yellow sunlight through its dusty pane. The shadows from a tree outside played across the dirty floor and broke up the lazy dance of dust motes in the stale air of the room. Along the far wall was a single iron bed frame. Long ago, It had been painted a clean, clinical, crisp white. Now the bars rusted and chipped, and the white long since turned to dusty gray, covering the dingy metal. The mattress sitting on it was sagging in the middle, striped and so dirty she couldn't tell what color it was originally intended to be. There were rumpled sheets that clearly never fit the thing at all, with a blanket and pillow tossed into the corner of the bed. Under it was the barest shadow of an old suitcase, its leather straps long ago sacrificed to the rot of this humid climate and the neglect of years past. In front of the bed, on the floor, was a pair of dusty shoes from a bygone era. They sat cockeyed, as if just slipped off by a young girl or boy whose feet turned inward from some shyness or infirmity. The toes of the shoes nearly touched, and the dust made the old leather look soft between the cracks. She had certainly added to the smell in the air of dust and old. She found herself wondering for the first time about the most recent inhabitants of this facility. The rats and spiders and other such creatures, were they still here? Would they come out to meet her with the light dimmed enough for them to feel safe? She shuddered at the thought. As if bitten by her thoughts, an emaciated rat scurried across the floor in the room. Where it had come from, she couldn't say, but it seemed quite familiar with the surroundings as it dodged trash and equipment around the room to reach its destination. A small hole in the corner of the wall nearest her, next to the open closet. She willed herself not to scream or jump and watched the rat's experienced maneuverings with a strange, morbid curiosity. When it dove into its hole, she found herself perversely drawn to crawl over to it and peer in, perhaps to see a family of rats sitting down to supper. She fancied the rat she saw was just going home after a long day at the mill, wherever that equivalent was in this place. 
and would soon put its feet up on a bit of fluff it had taken months back, ready to relax for the evening. It was at this point that she realized her mind was going to places she would rather it didn't, needing to keep her wits about her in this place. They had warned her that it would play tricks on her, that her mind would try to trap her here somehow. She silently cursed her imagination and went back to searching the room with her eyes. She refused to enter the space unless absolutely necessary, and unless what she sought was in the room, she wouldn't enter it at all. She craned her neck around to see into the dark closet where the door to the little cubbyhole was blocking the sunlight and turning it into a gaping maw of darkness. Damn, she whispered when she realized she wasn't going to get a good view unless she entered the room. Keeping her eye down and watching the floor for debris, she picked her way across the floor the same way she had in the hall. Something caught her eye for an instant, and her toe tapped the corner of a tin can, sending it rattling a few feet away. She held her breath, hoping the noise wasn't enough to elicit a response from the facility, and waited. Ten. Twenty. Thirty. When there was no reaction, she let out her breath and turned her full attention back to the floor between her and the open closet door. She took a step closer and felt the floor rumble slightly. Her heart fell as she realized that the sound had indeed woken it up, deep in the bowels of the building, and it was coming. The sound was faint at first, like a rolling thunder, except instead of coming from outside the dingy window, it was coming further inside the building. As it drew near, the sound grew and changed. It sounded like rusty pipes breaking, or children screaming. Then, it sounded like the whole place was groaning, straining to contain the thing. She leapt to the other side of the room, far away from the door, and reached inside her coat for something. She wasn't worried about making noise anymore. It already knew where she was. She cursed aloud as she fumbled with the trinket that caught the sunlight and gleamed softly for just an instant. She could hear it coming up the hall now, bashing carelessly against the walls as it filled the space. It reached the doorway to the room she was in and hesitated for only a moment, the last fading sunlight repelling it. As the sun sank, her heart sank with it. Knowing her best defense was gone, it turned then, facing her fully, and she almost shrieked in mind-numbing terror. It was surrounded by a black miasma, like smoke. Its head was impossibly high, easily eight to ten feet, and there was too little of it for what should have been this thing's head. That's when it hit her. The face was that of a child. That's why the head was too small. It was that of a small child atop this monstrosity. There were arms in the miasma that reached out for her, each of them capped by a hand with a face, a face that screamed in horror and pain. The top head leered at her, and the whole thing lunged through the door. In the last possible instant, her hand went up instinctively to ward it off, to protect her face. She had no idea. It just went up still with the trinket clutched in it. But though the sun had left, the trinket still gleamed and glowed. The creature shrieked and hissed, backing away but filling too much of the door. It was stuck. It crawled backward, up the wall, and away from her. She looked in her hand at the trinket, saw the glow, and thrust it out at the creature. It hissed and spat its venomous saliva bubbling on the floor before the door. Slowly, it managed to back away out the door, with the paladin following, still holding out the amulet of Amon Ra to push it back. At the doorway, she stepped in the bubbling venom without notice, her entire focus on the creature and pushing it back out of the room. The bubbling venom fizzled and was still crystal clear as water on the floor. The creature pulled back farther back down the hall, through another doorway, and then disappeared. She could hear it moving, feel the floor still shaking with its many-handed steps. Eventually, they faded to nothing, and she breathed a sigh of relief. 
replacing the amulet in her interior pocket. She had hoped not to have to show her hand so soon. But if that was the guardian here, things might be worse than they had thought at the priory. She would need to consult the monks back at the monastery before venturing any further in, much as she detested the delay. She made her way back up the hall to the front doors, pulling the pitted and rusty handle gently to open the large portal. As she gained the dusk outside, she heard a whimpering whine from deep in the facility and knew that for a moment, the creature would hide and lick its wounds rather than chase. And that, my friends, is what creepypasta is all about. And yes, that was very creepy. According to her Amazon profile, Swogar has been writing since she was a young child. Everything from picture books to novels from poetry to high fantasy prose, she has tried her hand at writing. She currently lives in Reno, Nevada with her family and enjoys people watching, particularly the weekend after Burning Man, which I would want to visit someday. I've thought about it, but it's so expensive. Her motto in life is, once in a while, declare peace. It will confuse the hell out of your enemies. I really like that. <laughs> I think I might try it sometime. Also, you can buy her books on Amazon. The two that she has on there are Mara's Journey and Diallo's Eternal Love. And you can also check out her Facebook page at facebook.com slash jswogarauthor. More creepypasta stories can also be found at www.creepypasta.com. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, stay creepypasta fam. <laughs>